Yeah. Okay, so this is the first of the questions, two questions that we'll go through. Uh, this question says, the device shown below is Outwards Machine. Again, it's a classic setup. That's why it even has its own name, Outwards Machine. And uh, there's a textbook example. It says, assuming that the masses of the string and the frictionless pulley are negligible, that's uh, important. That's going to help justify uh, some of the things that, um, some of the simplifications that we'll be making. So it's good. <laughs> Find an equation for the acceleration of the two blocks. Find an equation for the tension in the string and um, find both the acceleration and tension when the yeah, block has some mass. Uh, let me label this M1 and block two has some different mass M2. Okay, um, oh, I didn't need this. Uh, it's fine. <laughs> It'll give me some space to enter my answers to for acceleration, for tension, and then for, again, uh, values of acceleration and tension. Um, so for what I'm going to do next, I really didn't need to read past this. This is kind of the um, strength of the approach that we call standard strategy, which is that these set of steps that you will see me go through are the set of steps that we will go through every single time. Uh, you've seen this elsewhere before, but let me just spell it out so that I have it as reference. The first step will be we are going to be drawing free body diagram. And after we have free body diagram, then we are going to be defining coordinate axis. And there are some considerations that we go through as we do that. And then the third step uh, is, um, I guess for this question, we won't have to do, but let me write it out for the sake of com completeness. Um, we have to break down forces into components. Break down uh, force into the X and Y component. And finally, step number four is we write down Newton's second law equation, uh, which I guess I've been trying to write this the other way. <laughs> um, that shows the causation a little bit better, that acceleration is caused by net force, net force divided by mass. So this is the four steps in the standard strategy and um, and as soon as I uh, identify this as a fourth question, this is the set of steps that I would go through, kind of regardless of what they end up asking, because uh, whatever it is that they're going to ask me, um, after I've gone through these four steps, I'll be in a place where I can answer them super quickly, almost no matter what they ask. So let me first draw free body diagram. So we have, uh, or free body diagrams, you need one diagram for each object you are dealing with. So I'll draw one, uh, identify the by this dot for one mass, a block of mass one, and a separate diagram for the block of mass two. Okay. Purpose of the free body diagram is to identify all the forces acting on your objects in the system. So this is where uh, I say this in other places. It takes the most effort, creativity, consideration, time to uh, really draw this correctly. And even though this is a relatively simpler setup, I've seen people uh, make mistakes on these diagrams, even for the simpler setup. So as you are considering these free body diagrams, really you have two goals. One, identify all the forces on your objects. And two, um, don't identify anything that's not on your, I guess, uh, avoid misidentifying forces that are not on your object. And I think the number one advice I can give that's uh, help, useful, I think, is um, be guided by the fact that you have really only one non-contact force in this class, and that's gravity. And in fact, I should draw gravity here. So there will be gravity on each of these objects. So that's the one non-contact force you have. Um, that's the one force that you can identify without having identified what other thing is touching that object in order to exert that force. And all the other forces you will identify after having identified the gravity are the contact forces. Normal force, tension, spring, friction, 
and maybe apply the force if the problem specifies any. So here I'm looking at my object and as I stare at my object for a bit, what's touching it? Um, almost nothing is touching it except for the string here. So, okay, so I guess I better draw tension force from the string T1. And um, as a, and with my object one, um, <laughs> all the forces I'm identifying. And with these vertical forces I identified, uh, so I guess I drew them through the tension with some length, but this tension could be greater than weight, less than weight, um, acceleration kind of could be going up or down. That's the uh, constraint that I have so far with the forces that I have identified. And I think I'm fine with that. In this kind of pulley setup, the mass could be accelerating up or accelerating down. So I think I'm fine with that. Uh, let me look at mass two here. Um, and uh, there's only one thing touching mass two as well. So there's gotta be a tension force upward as well. Tension always pulls. So, and this will also give me some acceleration up or down um, kind of depends. So, and after having done that, I think this is the place where I ask myself, did I draw all the forces and um, kind of be a piece that I've identified all the things that are touching my object and could be exerting a force, that plus gravity. So I think I identified all the forces. I think as I'm looking to do step number two, is where I have to think through a little bit more carefully. So as I'm drawing this tension and masses, I kind of said, hey, I don't know if it's going to be accelerating up or down. And as I'm defining my coordinate system, I really want my coordinate axis to have where positive x direction is parallel to the direction of acceleration. So I think I kind of need to nail it down. And this is where knowing the masses helps a little bit. I do know that mass 2 is actually bigger. So, you know, thinking through it intuitively, I think intuitively that this will be accelerating downward and this will be accelerating upward. So, uh, so, and you know, th this is one of those things where if you happen to make a wrong guess, a lot of times you'll be fine. A lot of times really, um, what you, what you will end up seeing maybe at the end of the problem solving strategy is maybe some of the quantities you are expecting to be positive was negative. Then when you see that, then you realize, oh, some of these directions are the other way from what I thought and, and, and that's totally fine. And um, I've done one additional step here. As I'm labeling acceleration, I've used the same label for both of them. Partly because I recognize that with a, uh, with a string, basically however much this mass comes down is also however much this mass goes up. So there are two motions are kind of connected. So however much M2 is accelerating down, I think it has to be the same acceleration for M1. Otherwise the string will break or stretch or do the sort of thing that we don't want it to do. So, Oh, so uh, th that was all the preliminary steps to actually doing step number two. Uh, to ac actually do step number two, I have to define my coordinate axis. So for my mass M2, I'm going to define downward as my positive x. And for my mass M1, I'm going to define upward as my positive x. Now, um, you, you see that I'm defining my two co uh, or coordinate axis for the two objects independently. You have total freedom to do that. I'm demonstrating that. Um, you can also choose the same axis for both of them. I'll just say, if and when you do that, uh, you have to watch out for uh, sign errors. When you're writing down equations, you have to be more careful when you do that. So I'm going to stick with the choice I have because this is the choice that I found minimizes the possibilities for mistake. <laughs> so that's my default choice. Uh, step number three, I can skip it, break down forces into components. It's all one dimensional, kind of, so I don't really need to do that. So I'm finally at step number four. 
where we are going to be write, writing down equations, uh, Newton's second law equations. We write it for each object and because it's a vector equation for each direction, x and y. Here it's one dimensional, so I just have to write one equation per object. For two dimensional questions, you'll have to worry about that. So let me write down the equations for m1 first. I have, um, so acceleration of m1, uh, oh, which is a, I already gave it a symbol, that's equal to the net force on m1. So with the upward being positive, I have t1. And then uh, it, I prefer to write my equations in such a way that all the quantities I'll be uh, writing down are positive. So what that means is I'm going to indicate the direction of gravity downward or in the negative x direction in my equation as minus m1g. So that's uh, all the forces of my free body diagram. That's my net force. I have to divide it by the mass. And this is uh, the place to be a little bit careful. Um, the, this mass should be the mass of the object for which you are writing down Newton's second law equation. So this would be M1 for this uh, free body diagram that I'm basically copying over to this equation. So there's my first equation. Um, these labels are confused. Let me just erase this form <laughs> so that I can label this as equation one. I have one equation so far. Um, so I need to keep going through step number four to write down equation for my second object. So I'm just going to say, okay, Newton's second law again. Acceleration, same label, is equal to the net force. And here I define the downward as positive. So um, so I'm going to say plus m2g and then tension, upward tension, that's in the opposite direction from positive. So minus t2 divided by the mass of the object, m2. And here, if you imagine you had defined this in the other direction, then what should we have to be careful about here is the sign of the acceleration. Uh, here, the way it's written now, because of the way I defined my positive direction, my acceleration is in the positive direction, and all this is fine. But if uh, you defined it the other way, then you have to make sure that the sign in front of your acceleration reflects what it should be. Okay, so that's my second equation. And this is the kind of the end of the standard strategy. And this is the place where I would say, okay, stop, pause for a bit, take a stock of the information you have. The information are the equations. You have two equations. And the unknowns you have to solve for using those two uh, pieces of information. So I have unknowns as acceleration and tensions. So the way it's uh, written out here so far, um, I, be, I labeled my tension T1 and T2 as two separate values because it felt like, you know, tension here, tension here, are they related? Are they the same? Are they different? <laughs> and this is where this highlighted text is actually important, that the masses of the string and the frictionless pulley are negligible. Uh, if the pulley had a mass, then uh, you would need some kind of a difference in the tensions here to help angularly accelerate the pulley, uh, which uh, the rigid body rotation, which is also subject to in the future. Uh, so here, what's important is that pulley is frictionless. So there's no force being applied here that would uh, lead to a difference in the tension on either side. And its mass is also negligible. So no net or case needed to accelerate this. So, so with that note, I'm going to just go ahead and uh, change the label for tension so that it's just the one and the same value of tension for both the sides of the string. And, and this is gonna be quite common setup. So if you didn't do what I did and uh, pretended at first that these are gonna be different tensions, that's fine. It's not what I would call a mistake. Um, but I just want you to acknowledge that there are situations where these tensions can be different. So we have two equations, two unknowns. We should be able to solve it. So let's go ahead and do that. I guess we need both acceleration 
and tension. So um, no matter how what way you go about it, you're not really gonna save a lot of work. Uh, let me just do this. I'm gonna solve this for uh, solve equation two for tension. Plug it in in equation one to get me something that um, th that will be an expression for acceleration. Let me just scroll down a little bit and give me more room. Solving this for tension, uh, I'm going to do, let me do algebra step by step. So multiply both sides by M2. So doing that first, I have M2A is equal to, this M2 cancels out that M2. I have M2G minus tension. And uh, to get tension by itself, it looks like, uh, let me do this. I'm just staring at this for a bit, and I want to get tension without the minus sign on one side. I think I can do that if I add by T on both sides. Then I have tension with a positive sign on the left, no tension on the right, they cancel. But on the left-hand side, I still have M2A. So let me subtract M2A, and that will cancel out here, and I'll deal with the right-hand side as it comes up. So after you do these two operations to both sides, uh, that's kind of one of the important rules in algebra. Whatever you do to one side has to do, you have to do the same thing to the other side to maintain the equality. So on the left-hand side, I'm gonna have T and then nothing because that'll cancel that. T is equal to, on the right-hand side, I have M2G from before and T will have canceled out and I have minus M2A, minus M2A. And that's it. I guess I could have simplified a little bit more. Um, now, if you're trying to plug this in as an answer here, you will find that it doesn't work. And there's a very good reason for it. It's because uh, your acceleration is an unknown. You can't use acceleration in your expression for the answer for tension. So we're not done yet. Uh, we need one more step to get the acceleration. Um, so this is going to become our tool in substitution. We are going to plug this into the equation one to eliminate tension and get an expression that only depends on acceleration. So uh, let me imagine having done that and write it out here. Acceleration, so this is coming from equation one. Acceleration is equal to um, one over M1 times, I'm just writing that out so I don't forget. Tension, which is gonna be that, M2G minus M2A minus, uh, so that's tension, and then I need to remember to write that out, minus M1G. Okay, um, I'm gonna do this algebra in my head for the sake of time, and uh, I will <laughs> just uh, uh, pause the video and, you know, for those who are watching on recording, um, and, uh, and, you know, make sure I didn't make any mistake. So, uh, and then let me just uh, solve for acceleration. So the solved for value of acceleration is this. I'm gonna multiply both sides by one over M1 plus M2. So that'll give me acceleration is equal to the right hand side, M2G minus M1G over uh, M1 plus M2. And this is finally an expression that depends on, uh, depends on nothing but known quantities, the masses and, uh, and the G's. Uh, so, so this is something I can plug in as an answer there. Uh, acceleration is M2G minus M1G. And I think once you have derived it, I hope it makes some kind of an intuitive sense. This difference here, you can think of it as a kind of difference in the weight. You know, one weight is pulling the thing in the direction of acceleration, one weight is opposing it. So the difference between them kind of gives you the net force, quote unquote. And this is the total mass. So this is kind of like a net force divided by total mass. So once you have the final answer, you can kind of make a sense of it. Um, but like a, trying to guess that from scratch isn't what I would recommend. That's a, uh, you know, some of you might be able to do it, but it's a kind of bad habit. <laughs> what I really want you to learn in this class is the systematic problem-solving approach that works even when you don't necessarily have an intuition. Okay, so I'm gonna plug in this value of acceleration 
or this expression for acceleration into the expression for tension that will give me the tension in terms of all the known quantities. So tension is equal to, um, oh, yeah, do I, yeah, let me, you know, let me just do it this way. M2G minus, and then M2 times this whole thing of acceleration. Um, M, oh wait, I already wrote M2, oh wait, <laughs> but this is the other M2, M2G minus M1G divided by M1 plus M2. And um, there is a way to simplify it. Um, do I want to show that? Uh, let me do that. As a, I don't think I've done this demonstration before. So, because, um, uh, 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 you know, if you simply enter this as your answer, the system will accept it, it as correct. It is correct. If that's a, as far as you want to go, that's fine. I don't want to uh, leave any impression that that's somehow wrong. But um, there's a value in simplification. This question in particular, tension, if you work at it a little bit, it will simplify beautifully. So uh, let me do this simplification. I'm going to try to combine these two terms by putting them with the same denominator. So this is what that'll look like. So I'll have tension is equal to, okay, I need to, this term, I need to multiply top and bottom by the same quantity to uh, get me um, the same denominator. So it'll be M2G times M1 plus M2, and I have to, my parenthesis looks weird. Um, and I have to divide by the same thing so that I'm not actually changing anything. I'm multiplying by one minus. And as I'm writing this out, let me just uh, um, expand this M2 into these two terms here. So I have a N1 plus M2 with a numerator of M2 squared G. And then it, uh, um, do I want? Let me distribute the, distribute the minus as well, so that this will be plus, this will be minus, and distributing minus, that will be plus uh, M1 times M2G. And this is the beautiful simplification I want you to see. When I expand this out, you'll have M2 times M2, M2 squared. I have this already. So that will cancel that out. And I'll have M2 times M1, and I'll have plus M, you know, M1 times M2 or M2 times M1. So this tension force gets uh, simplified into this form. Two times M1 times M2G divided by M1 plus M2. And I think you, you saw this in the lab. Um, this kind of looks, uh, even though the setup in your lab was a little bit different, this looks quite similar to the, um, the expression for tension that you saw in the lab. One particular thing that this resembles is that when you swap M1 and M2, your tension doesn't change. So um, if somehow uh, you swap to these two, then the, the direction of acceleration will change. You know, acceleration will change here, change the sign, but um, the amount of Attention in the string doesn't change, which I hope makes sense with your intuition. So, so with that, let me plug that in. Um, or I'm gonna plug in the algebraic expression just to make sure I didn't make any mistake. And I think the numerical value, I can leave that to you. If the algebraic expression is right, then, um, then yeah, okay. If the algebraic expression is right, then uh, the numerical value should be right. Uh, I'm using underscore to enter this, by the way, minus M1G divided by M1 plus M2, and I'm using right arrow to escape that underscore thing, uh, 2 M1, M2. and the system uh, understands the implied multiplication, so that's why, why I'm deliberately not putting anything here, I, the system should still understand me fine, and there it is. Um, and you plug in the numbers to get numerical values here. 